testing in progress. Well, Zoe, first of all, I wanted to start off by saying congratulations on this documentary. I had a chance to sit down and and watch it, and it's an amazing documentary, so congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. That means, yeah, it means a lot to hear that. It's a, it's a lot of uh, hard work, so I'm glad it's landing. So, Zoe, where did this journey start for you? What first sparked you wanting to make this documentary? Um... So, I, it was back in 2019 uh, where I came across an article of Israel and he wasn't, he wasn't huge at that point, but I saw this image of, a, you know, a UFC fighter, but then he was talking about being in touch with his feminine side, painting his nails and doing therapy. And that was kind of intriguing enough for me to then go and chat to him. Um, and it just so happened that Fluoro Black, the production company, were also researching into his story. So we kind of teamed forces and, yeah, went on the journey together. You mentioned there a little bit about how Israel is different to how a lot of people would see the stereotype of an MMA fighter. What was it about him that made you want to do the doco? Like you said there, he was it was different to what you would expect. He painted his nails and things like that, but... Was there was that the story that you wanted to tell that you don't have to be the stereotypical fighter to to be successful in MMA? Yeah, I think on on surface, you know, uh, just on pure uh, like a surface level, that intrigued me. But then when I it wasn't until I met with him um, that I was really it really confirmed that I was on the right track, that he had a fascinating story. I mean, he's an immigrant, he's a dancer, he's a fighter, uh, and he's deeply, deeply into, you know, his mental health journey. Yeah. So there were just a lot of facets to him. I mean, the fact that he was a dancer within the fighting world was also really intriguing to me, and that kind of has become quite a big visual and emotional thread throughout the film. Yeah, definitely. So what was that like when you first sat down to talk to him? Um, how did you find him in that moment? And how did he receive the the news about you perhaps making a documentary about him? Yeah, so I remember it, uh, I remember it really well. We went out for dinner and I just, I, I just clicked with him. He was um, super humble and uh, engaged and just really excited about potentially making a film. But I think he could, uh, we could just vibe, and I, I think he could understand that I wanted to make a film that would reach an audience beyond his UFC fan base. Yep. Um, and I think also, you know, having a feminine, a, sorry, a female lens on it, um, yeah, he, he was just up for it. So it was, it was great. I have to ask, were you an MMA UFC fan before this? Because I, I sat down to watch this documentary with my wife, who's not a UFC fan, and she said she got so much out of this. Um, were you a UFC fan before this? Oh, that makes me so happy hearing that. Uh, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, while I had just a basic understanding of it, I couldn't really understand why two fighters would want to get in the ring and just, well, yeah, just smash each other. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was foreign to me, but I love jumping into kind of unknown worlds or places where I'm a bit of a fish out of water because I think your senses are hyper acute and you are just observing or listening really deeply. Um, so I, I, do, I do like being in those worlds, but it was really important to me, um, like I said before, to speak to more universal themes, and I think the themes within it are, you know, resilience and how the runt can rise. I mean, those were just very human, universal ideas that I could express, you know? Yeah, I was going to say that. I think, actually, um, the fact that you weren't a UFC fan probably helped with the making of the documentary, because I watch a lot of sports documentaries, and you watch some documentaries where you can tell the person who is making the documentary, is a huge fan of the person or the team, and they've become overawed when they're making the documentary, so it becomes a glory piece, whereas I think you probably picked up on things about Israel that 
a fan wouldn't have picked up on? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I, I genuinely believe that. Like, I, while I admired Israel when I first met him, I've never been, like, this adoring fan where I'm like, oh, my God, I've got to hang out with him 24-7. I, I was looking at a very interesting and deeply complex and flawed human that was in front of me. And so I, I, I think the film is better for it because it's not just this glossy fluff piece, which, you know, to be honest, there's so much of that out there. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned before that the idea first came about in 2019. Of course, that was during the pandemic. Did that hold things up for you at all before you could start work? Yeah, it was a bit of both. Like we had shot, uh, we had shot, I believe, Whitaker, the, the first Whitaker fight. Um, and then we shot some stuff in the gym during COVID and lockdown. Um, it certainly held it up, but at the same time, it was a really good way to keep kind of researching and developing it. So we just kind of got stuck into it. Yeah. One of the things I love about documentary filmmaking is that there's no script to start with. The story goes where the, the subject takes it, basically. How different is what we see today as the finished product from where you imagined the story would go in the first place? Yeah, I think it's actually weirdly pretty close. While there's, while there's story points that, you know, sure, I can't write, I was interested right in the beginning um, about how this man who was once so severely bullied somehow had to morph him morphed himself into what he despised and hated the most in life, which is a bully. Yeah. And so right at the beginning, I was kind of curious about this question. What if to become the top, you have to become what you hate the most? And that kind of does still, you know, the film does follow that. Yep. Yeah. What were the things that you learnt about Israel as the, as the film went on? What kind of things did you that did you learn that you didn't know beforehand? Oh, what did I learn? He has got a remarkable ability to talk to himself in a way that serves him. I think so many of us suffer from you know negative self hate or you know talking to ourselves and in a really unhelpful way. What I observed with him is he is, he's just got this remarkable self-belief and that comes through his words. Yep. Um, and the other thing that I loved was his ability to change his mental state through physicality, through physical movement, whether that's just dancing or um, movement. He, whether he, whether he knows he does this consciously or not, that's what I observed. And I, I, I yeah, I definitely took took a little note out of his book there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should have asked this before. Did You said that you didn't understand at the start when you first started working on Stylebender about why two men would walk into a ring to smash each other. Did you learn why when you were making the doco? Oh, man, I learned so much about that and the complexity that comes with that. The big, the big thing I learned was... That you know, it, it looks like the solo pursuit when you see the the man at the end raising his hands with the belt. It kind of looks like he's just accomplished it himself. Whereas I really realised um, how important team is and and how that team gets that fighter to that point. And that's where you know one of the one of the most beautiful aspects about the film that I really adore is um, the exploration of his coach Eugene. Because yeah. Eugene is just this really down-to-earth, incredible um, guide in Israel's life that just cuts through the bullshit. Yeah, yeah. So how did Israel take having cameras around him all the time? Because I know some people deal with that really well and some don't. I've had two friends over the years go in Big Brother and one couldn't cope with it and was glad that he was voted out early because he just couldn't get used to the cameras being around and the other friend loved it. Oh, how did Israel take having cameras around him so often? Was it did he warm to it pretty quickly? I think he has learnt to adapt to it. I mean, the UFC is a massive machine, and there's cameras on those fighters all the time. Uh, I was also lucky that one of his friends, Jeff Salah, had been filming a lot of um, kind of behind the scenes footage with Israel prior to me jumping on board. 
So that was really helpful footage. And then I think, you know, like he's a busy man. So whenever I had to go in and interview him or hang out with him or film with him, I was really, uh, what's the word? I, I had done the research, so I, I didn't mess with his time. I, yeah. I made sure that what I was getting was really essential and, yeah, compelling footage, I guess. Yeah, I was going to ask that. From from a director's point of view as well, you, you're telling Israel's story and you want people to see the natural him. As a director, how do you make sure that the person is being natural when the camera is around? Because, like, my friend who went into Big Brother who loved it, I don't think Australia saw the true him. I think he almost put on a character while he was in there because the cameras were there. Do you? How do you make sure that you have your subject being natural when you're filming? Yeah, I think some characters are more are more natural than others. And I think Israel, luckily, was so natural in front of the cameras. He never really dialed it up for me, and uh, you know, unless I was making him jump on a bath with flowers. <laughs> But, you know, those natural interactions, um, he just is who he is. And what I feel proud about in the film is that you kind of love him and hate him. You see all these facets of him. Yep. You know, whether I, I won't describe exactly what those are, but some of them are pretty ugly. Yeah, and yeah. they're hard to watch. But if I didn't have those in there, you know, back to your point before, I, I think people would have thought that I was a fan or it was a promo piece or so yeah I, that's what i'm proud about is it does show all aspects of of israel definitely and i guess a lot of the filmmakers out there that listen to this show would probably be interested in the answer to this question did you find it difficult to to work with a, a huge body like um ufc like you said it is a little bit of a circus and I, i've spoken to filmmakers before that have made sports documentaries and, and they've said that it's kind of been a difficult process working with a sporting league. How did you find that process, or did they kind of keep their hands off the doco? Yes, strangely, uh, I found it really easy. I mean, perhaps that's credit to the producers who were massaging um, all those relationships and hookups behind the scenes. But I, yeah, the whole experience was, was great for me, you know, getting access behind... Um, you know, behind the scenes at the UFC, all the managers. I mean, it was, yeah, I was amazed at how easy all that was for me personally. Yeah. And what was it like filming at those huge events? Like, that must have been um, a bit of a task in itself as well. It was wild. It was wild. And I guess, you know, when you're backstage and you're, you're, you know, when you're in the front, you're seeing all the hype of it. You're seeing these guys coming out. They're all jacked up and screaming and yelling. But then, you know, and backstage, I was really interested when you were seeing a lot of these fighters come out who were just lost, and they just lost it crying. Yeah. But I, I, yeah, it was actually really fascinating for me personally. I mean, not that that part is in the doco, but yeah, there's yeah. complexities to it for sure. Seeing stuff backstage like that can change everything. I worked as a cameraman for a while um, at Melbourne International Fashion Week, and I used to get to see the chaos that used to happen behind behind stage, and you would literally see models in an absolute emotional mess because uh, something couldn't be found to go out on stage, and then they would just change within an instant that I had to go out. It, it, does that, that, that open up for you as well, like a whole new world, seeing that what happens backstage at UFC? Yeah, it, it certainly opened up a whole new world, but I think beyond that, uh, I think, you know, back to the film, I think what you see with Israel is that while, you know, the rest of the world kind of looks at him like the superstar or someone above and beyond, he is so human in this film. Yeah. And what I've been hearing is that loads of people have just found that really, um, what's the word, really inspiring because they can kind of see that they have potentially the possibility to achieve the things that he has, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think I think that's pretty cool about film. You touch on some very, very deep topics in the film as well. Uh, immigration, um, bullying. Um, what was Israel like when you sat down to talk to him about some of those more deeper emotional uh, parts of his life? Yeah, especially when it came to bullying. Uh, he 
he would at times almost morph into that young bullied kid especially when we went back to his school in Rotorua I could see and feel what he was kind of picking up on when he when he wandered through the playground he, he was kind of resistant to answer some of my questions at times um so yeah I I think that young kid is very much still in there but he's learnt to wrangle it and be at peace with it you know definitely so I know we are running out of time very very quickly so I, I wanted oh, to a- I wanted to ask what do you want people to take away from Stylebender? If someone goes in to watch this film, what would you like them to take away from it? Mm, I think one of the best outtakes that you can get from this story or Israel's story is that perhaps the thing that you were bullied at, bullied for at school is actually your weapon. It's that kind of your, your oddness or your strangeness or your unique voice is your absolute weapon in life and that's what what people actually love you for so yeah maybe maybe the takeaway is just be your weird self and be cool with that i like that